Hey there, it's been a while since I've made a video, but I'm back and I wanted to pick up, I was just sitting here this morning uh, reading after breakfast from 2 Timothy and I realized that one of the videos I had made was uh, primarily focused on 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 and I kind of wanted to just pick up right where, um, right where Paul goes with that verse in this letter that he wrote to Timothy and, and just sort of follow that thought out. Um, 2 Timothy 3.16 is a classic verse. Everybody knows it. It's, it's, um, well, it starts out in the New American Standard. All scripture is inspired by God. Um, a couple other translations, uh, rather than kind of going with the Latin word uh, from inspired, they, they go with the Greek word and they, and they say that uh, all scripture is God-breathed. And uh, the, the Latin word there for inspired is inspirata, and the, the Greek word is theonoustos, where we, you know, literally God breathed. And did a, did a whole video on that. I believe it's called Inspired, Not Me and Not You. And it's, it's, it's about how um, that word inspired in the English language has really, uh, has really kind of evolved to mean something entirely different than it meant, than it meant uh, three, four hundred years ago when translators began, began using that word. Um, but anyway, we, we focused on what is the doctrine of inspiration. And, and, and Paul tells Timothy here that all scripture is inspired by God. And he says it's profitable for teaching which uh, teaching would be, uh, he's saying that, that scripture is useful for, for telling us what's right. And then it, for reproof, he's saying um, it's, it's, it's useful to, to tell us what's not right. Um, you know, reproof is telling you what's wrong. Um, and, and it's useful for correction, he says, which is, is how to get right. And, and then training in righteousness, and that's how to stay right. So it, it, scripture has sort of this, um, this, this fourfold aspect to it. To it uh, that that you know tells us where we are, where we shouldn't be, how to get where we should be, and how to stay there once we get there. And 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 then verse seventeen starts out so that and that's a that's a purpose clause or uh, the whole reason for for what he's just said in verse sixteen is so that the man of God may be adequate and equipped for every good work. In other words, without scripture, uh, we're not equipped for every good work, um, and neither are we adequate. And, and so it's. Um, you know, this is this is vital. This is fundamental. And then in in, in and that's the end of chapter three. Um, the beginning of chapter four. He uh, he starts out with this is one of the strongest, uh, I guess, exhortations for a lack of a better word. But but Paul just uh, he piles up sort of piles up reason upon reason upon reason upon reason um, why he's about ready to command Timothy what he's about ready to command him. So let, let's just look at these. He says. Uh, he says, I solemnly charge you. And uh, solemnly, that's not a, it's a word we're familiar with, but we don't use it a whole lot. But when we think of something solemn, we think of a, you know, a, a funeral procession or, or uh, you know, something catastrophically bad has happened, either a natural disaster or a war has broken out and, and everybody's kind of glued to the TV set watching the, you know, watching the news anchor to see what they're going to say. That's a, that's a solemn occasion. Or, or the news of some something that really bad has happened, or, or uh, a a two you know two two Marine Corps officers dressed in dressed in their 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 dressed materials, carrying a uh, their dress clothes, uh, carrying an American flag, and walking up and knocking on a on a mother's door. Um, that's that's solemn. So that's how he starts this out. I solemnly charge you, and then he says, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus. So. Um, the thing I'm about ready to command you, Timothy, um, just pretend that God himself and, and Jesus Christ himself is, is standing right here with me, writing this epistle or, or standing over your shoulder as you're reading it. So, I mean, you know, Paul, he, again, he's just piling up the reasons of, of how serious this is. And then he says, who is to judge the living and the dead? So this, you know, Jesus Christ, the son of God, that's, that's, in the presence of, you, of me writing this letter and of you reading this letter, just, re, just remember that, you know, if that wasn't awesome enough as it is, just remember that every single person that's ever lived is going to stand before him and be judged for the things that they've done. And then he says, and by his appearing. And, and we know from the New Testament, from, from Paul and, and Jesus himself and John and others, that Jesus' appearing, you know, it's, it's one of those things that... Um, I believe Jesus describes it as, um, you know, a lightning storm. Everybody sees that. Everybody in the East and everybody in the West, you know, everybody sees that. That's how it's going to be when I come back. And so 
he's, he's, you know, <laughs> again, he's just piling on these concepts. And then he says, and his kingdom, you know, it almost kind of brings you back to Psalm 2, you know, where he's the, he's the king enthroned on, on, on Zion and, and he rules the nations with a rod of iron. And so, <laughs> you know, he's piled all these things up. It's, it's solemn. It's in the presence of God. It's in the presence of Christ Jesus. And recall, let's, let's remember that he's going to judge the living and the dead. Let's also think about his appearing, how awesome that's going to be. And then let's think about how he's the, he's the despotate. He's, the, he's the, the king, the ruler of the entire world, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And in view of all of those things and all these things that I've piled up to remind you of how serious this is, he says three things. Preach the word. And so the this is almost sort of the strongest command that Paul gives just as far as the grammar goes in, 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 in all of the things that Paul wrote. And, and what is the command? Preach the word. He's telling Timothy, a pastor, this doesn't necessarily apply to all of us, but to pastors, preach the word. That's your main job. That is, that is the main, main, main thing is to preach the word. That word preach is the word, uh, is the word caruso. It's, it means a, to, to proclaim or, or a herald uh, the job of a Caruso in, in, in the ancient land, you know, prior to, you know, <laughs> telephones and email and, and, and the rapid communication that we have when a, when a king was going someplace and, and he was going to go into a village, he would send a messenger ahead, a person that would literally run. And, and when he got there, he would typically, you know, blow a, blow a trumpet or something and, and, and everybody in the town would gather around and then he would read a message from the, from the king and, and it was, you know, the, the king is coming here and he's going to be here soon. And, and this is what he wants from you when he arrives. And that's, that's the picture of, of, of the word preach, the word caruso. So, so we are to, to proclaim the word. And then he says, be ready in season and out of season. In other words, um, you know, there's going to be a time where preaching the word is going to be kind of um, easy and powerful and I guess I don't want to be irreverent, but but fun, something that you enjoy doing. And then there's going to be other times where it's not any fun at all and people are resistive to it. But, but you, I mean, you have got to be about this thing, Timothy. And then he says, he says three things, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with, with great patience and, and, and doctrine, uh, literally doctrine. And those three words, reprove. So this is, what does preaching look like? What do we, when we say preach the word, what does that actually look like? Well, it looks like three things, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. And reprove is that, um, well, it's also, that word is also used by Jesus in Matthew 18 in that passage that, that begins to talk about church discipline where he says, um, he says, if your brother has sinned to you, go to him and show him his fault. Uh, those, fo- those four English words, show him his fault, is, is the, literally the one Greek word from which we, we get reprove. And so one of the things that, if you're a pastor, your job is to show people their fault. I know that don't that don't fly well today. And again, we're we're not really in season. We're really out of season in the in, in the culture that we live in. And the other word, rebuke, is um, remember that story where Jesus is is asleep in the boat, and there's a storm, and the disciples think they're you know they're going to drown, and they finally wake him up, and he gets up and he says it says he rebuked the wind and the waves. It's 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 literally where he just said stop. And, and, and so that's, <laughs> that's the other, the other, the other um, you know, adjective that's used to describe preaching the word is, is you tell people to stop. That's another thing that don't fly. That's definitely out of season today. And then, and then exhort. Um, that one kind of sounds a little bit better, but it really it's um, like it's also used uh, Romans 12, 1, where it says, Therefore, in view of God's mercies, I, I beseech you to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. It's to exhort is to is to tell people like, you know, in view of everything that God has done and that that that, that He has saved us and everything that He has done, the, the only reasonable thing for you to do, the only reasonable response is for you to, you know, whatever, to do X, Y, and Z. And so that's that's the picture of that's the picture of, of, of preaching. And and uh, and then he says, you know, time will come when people won't endure sound doctrine. Um, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. And that's sort of funny imagery and having your ears tickled and 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 whatnot. But what he's what he's really saying there is is the time's going to come when people just want to hear positive, encouraging things. It's not that they're it's not that they're saying you know we don't want to hear any Bible. It's that they're saying we only want to hear the parts of the Bible that make us feel good. And that's I mean that is a that is everywhere in our culture today. We have entire ministries that are based upon 
taking verses out of the Bible, picking out the ones that are going to make you feel good or the ones that are going to do whatever, whatever it is. I mean, I just use the word positive and encouraging. That comes from a, a, a local radio station. I'm not trying to pick on that radio station either, but, but we have entire ministries that are, you know, their stated goal for ministry is to actually take the Bible and to literally edit it. And I don't mean to be offensive using that word, but to literally take out the parts that are going to make people feel positive and encouraging or whatever the, whatever the adjectives are. And then, and, then, and then the rest is excluded because it doesn't fit into that criteria. I mean, that's, you know, we think happy and good thoughts when we hear, you know, somebody's going to give us the positive and encouraging verse for the day. But if you really stop and think about what's happening there, it's what Timothy is describing here. And it's, it's people will, and, and, and verse four is a contrastive statement. He says, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. They're not turning away from the truth in the sense that they're saying, I hate God's word. They're saying, I only want certain parts of God's word and the rest of it, I don't want. And, and, and so that's, you know, I mean, this is, this is entirely indicative of the world in which we live in. And so um, just an encouragement to all those who are, you know, pastors or teachers or whatever, preach the word. <laughs>